Hello and welcome to another Pressing In. My name's Jeremy and our goal here at Pressing In is to help us as the church take what we're learning on a Sunday morning, wrestle with it and apply it to our lives in practical ways, Monday through Saturday. And so we love that you guys are joining us and we love that we get to do this together. So I wanna, guys, uh, we've been talking a little bit off camera about what we're all experiencing. And I know one of the themes I'm seeing in the people I'm around um, is this feeling of being overwhelmed. It, it is this feeling of being overwhelmed and overwhelmed for one of two reasons. The first reason might be like, Unlike some people, like they've still got their job and now they're doing maybe two and a half times the work or they're working from home with kids or with roommates and things like that. And so they don't feel less busy. They feel crazy in this season of Corona with all the amount of work. The other side of that is those that have lost their jobs, those that are overwhelmed financially, those are overwhelmed by what if their parents get this? What if their kids get this? What if they themselves get this? You know, all this kind of stuff going, all the unanswered questions of our future. And so, Specifically with what we talked about this week, really what it looks like to care for people. I wanna start off with, Todd, you quoted Jonathan as, from a conversation you guys had earlier in the week and, and where he asked the question, what's our purpose? Like how does, so I guess here's my question. How does a person who feels overwhelmed in this season, regardless of why they're overwhelmed, how do they really lean in and find their purpose in this season? So I just want to start off the conversation like that, because I think that's what we really are wrestling through in a lot of ways. So Crystal, J Todd, okay. Um, I think we've been talking in women's life about um, a couple things. One is, I think our purpose as Christ followers is always to glorify God. So no matter what's happening in the middle of what's going on, our purpose is still to praise and that praise is a spiritual weapon. So I think that's a good starting place, especially for people who maybe struggle with anxiety or depression anyway. And then isolation just makes everything feel worse. Um, to have that mindset switch of really fighting for your peace and using praise as a spiritual weapon to do that, I think that's a, a really easy, solid place to find purpose right away. Yeah, I know. Uh you know, for me, like one of the things that came up as you were talking about this was Paul when he says, you know, keep your eyes fixed on the author, the finisher of your faith. Like my purpose is Jesus's purpose. And so the more that I get to know him and see what he's about and I keep my eyes fixed on him. You know, I also think of Peter uh, when he got out of the boat and walked on water, you know, as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, you know, times are turbulent, they're really difficult. And if we take our eyes off of him, we're not going to be able to see what we're supposed to be about. So absolutely spending time in scripture, seeing what Jesus is all about. Yeah, that would actually, it brings up a follow-up question. Well, Craig, I'll get your thoughts on what it looks like to discover our purpose in the season in a moment. But what does that look like? We say, keep our eyes on Jesus. What does that practically look like every day for a person to keep their eyes when the storm is clearly all around. The storms and their kid throwing that fit on the ground while they're trying to be on a Zoom call. There's, the storm is in their bank account and their finances. The storm is in wow, what their bosses are asking them to do that they weren't responsible for out before Corona. What does it look like in the middle of those storms to keep their eyes on Jesus? Jumping off a practical way would be able to get in the New Testament, in the Gospels and see how Jesus responded and how he interacted with people. If you can mimic that kind of stuff, I mean, you know, we I've heard you say this, you act your way into believing or, you know, experiencing faith like that. And so if you start to do the things that he does, I think some of that stuff will come behind it in those moments. Yeah, I think we're talking about this whole idea of, of faith and believing. And I think we need to truly believe that we are God's masterpiece, that He is working in and through us, even in spite of our circumstances. Something that I, I said to someone the other day is not focusing on the circumstances, but focusing on the God of the circumstances, because obviously this didn't surprise him and it's not like he didn't see it coming. And so he has a purpose in it. And when I was you know, on my way here today, I was thinking about Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. We as the body of Christ, are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
But see, there's that point. We should walk in them. Join him in the work that he's doing inside of us. No matter where we're at, no matter what our circumstances that we're going through, he has a purpose in it and he wants to use it to change us. And so we need to join him in that work. Even if it is at home with our kids and we're not used to it and we're exhausted and we're tired, just look for him in those moments. Um, and you might not have the opportunity to be with your kids as much, but now you do. And so you have to celebrate him in every moment that he's given you. And I think that's key. I, mean, I do think that's a, uh, that's a good one. It goes back to the first week of Corona when we had to change all the services and that whole idea of here's my anxiousness, but here's what I'm thankful for. I think practicing gratitude in this season is a huge part of keeping our eyes focused on him because there is a lot of storms around us. But when I can latch hold of these things, but God, you're good in this way to me. This is what I am thankful for. My wife and I have regularly been reminding ourselves at no other point in our family's history have we had this kind of time together, nor will we ever probably again have this type of time together. We can be grateful for that, even in the midst of the frustration at times. I met with um, you know a group on Monday night, our greeting team, and one of the guys in the group, um, Gary, shared something that he had read in a devotional that morning. And what it said was, is that this may be the greatest opportunity of our lifetime to advance the gospel, to do that even at home within our families, to slow down and try to maybe see what is God's purpose in all this. There's got to be something bigger that he wants us to see. And a purposeful slowing down will allow us that opportunity versus the fast paced society that we're so used to where things just blow us by and we miss them. Mm -hmm. Crystal, what does it look like to keep your eyes on Jesus? in storms. Yeah, I think one of the things is memorizing scripture. So we're trying to memorize Psalm 46 right now because if it's in your heart, if it's in your brain already, in those moments throughout the day where you feel stressed with the kid who's having the tantrum or the finances are looking really rough or you get something in the mail from the bank or whatever it looks like, you have a moment that's already in there to stop and pause and remember his truth and invite God into that moment and say, what do I do with this bank statement? What do I do with this kid who's losing his mind? Um, and honestly, I think if we're not if we're not intentional about it, if we're not choosing it right now, it's not going to just appear magically. We have to really be pressing in and be intentional about who Jesus is and putting His Word into our brain, into our heart. So for us, that's what it is. I love you using pressing in right there, Crystal. Uh -huh. Love that. <laughs> she said something that was huge, though. If you focus on the storm and the circumstances and the stress versus the promises of God that are truth. You see, we can combat all of those things with the truth. And so she talked about a huge spiritual discipline with scripture memory, but also being a good steward. You said something in, in the uh, video for Sunday morning that this isn't wasted on God. God doesn't waste anything. And so I think that's huge. So being a good steward of what he's actually given us in the moment. Um, and I think we need to focus on that more. So another quote from Jonathan in Puerto Rico, one of our partners uh, that Todd gave us was this whole idea of the difference between a bunker and a greenhouse. That a bunker is something where you, you close up everything and you just try to stay safe and you so try to survive the battle or whatever else is happening. But a greenhouse, it grows things. And we want to, be, I think the church needs to be a greenhouse in this season. That's a challenge though. What does it look like for us to practically be the greenhouse? To create that in our homes, with our roommates, it, with our brothers and sisters, it, out in our community the way that we can, um, in this whole keeping social distancing. What does it look like for us to be a greenhouse? I think recognizing that uh, you know, the first question is, what, what's your purpose? So in, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, part of that is I'm on mission with him and I can't separate that out. And so that helps inform, you know, the great thing about a greenhouse is that you get those things. I mean, you've talked about people feeling um, unsafe and afraid and anxious and all that stuff. You're still protected in a greenhouse, just like a bunker, but you also get to look around at the world around you. And this slowing down does afford us the opportunity to see people near us who are in need 
And then, you know, we're, we're all wired up with different abilities. So what can you do? And just, just take a, a step that gets you out of that paralyzed feeling. If we just take one tiny step and bring and add faith to that and go, well, I could encourage my neighbor. I could pick up the phone and just start there. And then, and then just ask God, what's the next one I can do? I think if we start small and add those ingredients together, it helps us break out of that paralyzed feeling. I totally agree with that. I think starting small is, is super key because people feel like if I'm not doing the big thing, then I don't have anything to offer, which is like completely the opposite. I, I was thinking a lot about um, the story where Jesus is in the temple and he has the widow and she gives her two little pennies. And he says that's more important because she gave what she had. And so my question for people is, what do you have? It doesn't have to be big. What do you have? Do you have an elderly neighbor on your street? Do you have people you know who are struggling with being isolated? You have a phone. My phone is in my hand 24 seven. So calling people, texting them, reaching out. So I think that's just, for me, that's the question right now is. Smaller acts yeah. are a bigger deal than we realize in moments like this because they express love, connection, care. I mean, they express all these fruits of the Spirit that we just haven't been afforded that opportunity. We haven't been afforded, and God cares about the small. In fact, I think He cares about it more sometimes than He cares about the big stuff, because the big stuff is flashy and woo whatever, and nobody sees the small. But how many times in Scripture does Jesus say, like, go in and do something in secret? So, I love that. Yeah, yeah I even think to take the metaphor further, greenhouses, you don't start, like if I'm creating this garden in a greenhouse, it doesn't start all full and big. It starts with a tiny little seed. It literally starts with a tiny little seed. And that's what things sprout up from in those kind of things. I, I even think about the whole idea of what Paul talked about when he was talking to the church at Corinth, where he said, you know, Apollos plant, or I planted, Apollos watered, and God caused the increase. I may have reversed those. Uh, th that, But the point is, is they each had a small part to play. Ultimately, it's God that causes the increase. And I think that's what can feel so overwhelming to me and to us at times. We we think we're responsible for the increase. We think we're responsible for this big thing that's supposed to happen. When God is saying, no, 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 I just want you to do the small thing and I've given you what you need to do the small thing and trust me with the increase. He's not only given us what we need, he knows exactly what we need when we need it. He knows what's best. And so I think what you said is, is huge. Be willing to be the one who plants, be willing to be the one who waters, but leave the increase to him. Later on in that passage, it says, he who plants and he who waters aren't anything but God. And so our focus and our purpose, it must be on God, on glorifying him, on his magnification above everything else. And in doing that, you get to enjoy him. And that is internal and there's nothing else like it. And so we're trying to look for this, maybe sometimes happiness and purpose from external things when he's stirring inside of us for it to come from inside and out to the world. And that's kind of the greenhouse. We can look out, we can see it as he's churning and stirring in us and be like, boom, opportunity, opportunity. They're always there. They are always there. And so I like what Todd said too about being in the greenhouse that I forget exactly what you said, but you said something about there's life and you can look around and see. And I think, when you start with the small things, it's not just going to benefit the person you're trying to reach out to, it's going to benefit you too, because it takes that focus and you start to see that life that you were talking about. Yeah, and I think that's that upside down kingdom thing that we often forget. When we lose our life, that's when we actually gain it in the upside down kingdom. When we give our life away, that's when the anxiety, that's when the overwhelmness starts to die. We think I've got to hold on to it. I mean, that's what our culture is doing right now, right? Hoarding everything to get as much as they can to survive the season. And the upside down kingdom of God says, as I give it away, even in small little bits, as I give it away, I will start to experience the life, the freedom, the fullness of God. I think what we're experiencing as a culture is a lot of us have built our life at the end of Matthew chapter eight on sand. Mm -hmm. And that sand is being washed out and Jesus is giving us this opportunity to go, no, 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 what I've been telling you this whole time, if you'll build it on the rock, and one of those rocks is, if you give your life away, you'll gain it. You'll experience that rest and that peace, my easy yoke that he talks about when we live that out. You talked about a fullness. 
You know, we've been talking about the body of Christ and being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, I think it's 22 and 23, it says, and he put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so as he fills us with his fullness, it then overflows where we can fill everything in every way, every nook and cranny, wherever God's placed us, whether it's in the home, whether it's at our job, whether it's out there at the grocery store, wherever it is, we get to be his fullness. And we get to be that jar of clay that he creates into a burning lamp. So I wanna wrap up with this. I love the fact we're talking about caring for people and these little things we do. How do we keep that from just becoming good things we do? Because there are a lot of people, a lot of celebrities out there. Good things are getting a lot of press right now. We're the church. We're meant to introduce, even what Dave talked about last week, we're to connect people, not just to good things, but we're to connect people to God. How do we keep these from just becoming good things we do and help them become the God things that the church was put here for? Does that make sense? How do we do that? I think, the key is going to be when all of this settles down and things go back to normal. If it's just a good thing and we were just looking to kind of maybe get some credit for ourselves, it'll stop and everything will go back to the way it was. But if it's a God thing and this is something that he had a plan and a purpose in, which I believe that he does, then if we don't change and go back to the way we used to be, but we actually focus more on people, focus on the intentionality and doing the things that we're doing now and not stop, then we're gonna be not having that bunker mentality even afterwards. Cause we can like look at this greenhouse mentality now, but then all of a sudden go back to a bunker mentality after this is all over and go back to our normal, go back to our usual. And for me, there's no life in that. And so I think that this has to be constant change if it's going to be a God thing and we truly see it that way. What are your guys' thoughts? How does this become a God thing? I think for me, it's in, it goes just back to being intentional. God has invited us to salvation, to new life, all of that. But when I look at scripture, I see him over and over again, asking us to be intentional. Like when he says, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all of the things, that's an intentional choice that doesn't just magically happen in us. So what you said, Craig, is super true that after all of this is is done for this season, um, if we haven't been intentional right now in the middle of our fear or anxiety or a pain or whatever it is, if we haven't been intentional to seek Christ and to seek His kingdom, then after it's done, all of the things will not be added to us because we haven't, we haven't asked Him to do it in the middle of what we're experiencing right now. So I think um, it starts with just asking God, like where, where do you want me to move? What do you want me to do? And seeking His face, and not just once in a while, but every day, right? Especially right now, but every day. Um, so I think for me, it's just it just goes back to being intentional. And I think that's that's really cool. Even, again, we're talking about the small things. I think even that small, simple ask, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Like like what do you want me to do in this next hour, in this next moment, today? Like, what do you want me to do today? I think if we could ask that question on a regular basis and be open to what he says, I think that would have long lasting God type moments that we won't be able to explain because it'll be his fingerprints. Todd? Yeah, I falling back on our purpose. If you start with, you know why you're doing what you're doing, you know, we're becoming like Jesus, so we're living it out like him. You're gonna love your neighbor. I mean, what's gonna make you leave your, your house and walk over and check on your neighbor or do something when you're afraid? It's out of love for them. And so if our motive is his mission, which is that they would come to know Jesus, uh, if it starts with that, then um, it's, gonna, it's gonna drive what we do. And so getting to know Jesus. I wanna leave everyone with this. It's a series we've actually done twice at Blue Ridge through the years. We called it Up and to the Right. But I think in this circumstance, it brings a whole nother element to the truth and a security and a cornerstone that we can plant this season we're going through um, on. And so 2 Peter chapter 2, verse three says, his divine power, not mine, his divine power has given us has given me, Jeremy Wilkinson, 
everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given us everything we need. The question is, and I think what we need to be wrestling through is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe, do I really believe that today he has given me everything I need to live out his divine purpose in my life? Thanks for joining us, guys. We love you. Love doing this with you.